Thank you so much, Dennis. My sincerest apology and everyone else. Um, technology challenges. I had literally had to change devices. I hope I am clear or a little bit more clear now. Um, I think the first thing that I'd like to speak about particularly when we're talking about partnerships um, with grassroots organizations or organizing groups that aren't necessarily particularly included in formal civil society structures, is the need to understand and review um, considerations for diversity and inclusion. And I say this, acknowledging the fact that the same oppressors in terms of erasing gender diversity, the same um, oppressors who deny the existence of the climate crisis that we're in now, are essentially the same um, demographic and these are demographics that generally have power in terms of governance, power in terms of essentially civic participation um, in different forms of advocacy spaces. And I think the need to understand that um, the most marginalized, the most vulnerable, and the most subject to systematic stigma, discrimination, and injustices would ensure that um, bring, putting them at the front of the line in terms of advocacy messages, front of the line in terms of service delivery and accountability um, beyond just uh, treaty bodies and procedures will ensure that everyone's needs can be um, considered. And I think this is something that we have to be central towards in terms of considering the fact that there are those people who will have technolo technological challenges, there are those people who will have language challenges, and these are things that we must be able to consider if we're going towards a more global and um, equal world. Um, another aspect that I'd like to touch on is the fact that there's a huge um, gap in terms of solutions building around human rights issues and standards as well as the sustainable development goals. So political commitments, when you're talking the Paris Agreement, when you're talking um, agenda, Africa's Agenda 2063, SADC's Gender Protocol, all of these have similarities, particularly when you're addressing issues of those who are subject to poverty, those in underserved, under-resourced, and rural areas, and the need to leverage technology to ensure that there are synergies. Um, one interesting dynamic is that you find there's never the same composition of government delegation when you're going to the African Commission on Human and People's Rights and the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And the need to understand that there's a need to create synergies around this, and amnesty being well positioned in terms of um, geographic footprint, in terms of diversity in thematic areas is uniquely positioned to enable those who wouldn't necessarily be in the room or the decision-making table. Um, one other aspect is with regards to young people and young people's involvement. Um, there's a lot of tokenism. There's a lot of assumption that young people will be leaders for tomorrow when they are present here and today. And the need to understand that a lot of actors now do not necessarily need uh, formal organizing or institutions. When you you look at the example of South Africa and the Fees Must Fall movement, you found that you know, this was a group of different young activists who were mobilizing and um, somehow achieved free education for a certain demographic. Serving. Um, similarly, you're finding that a lot of activists are operating outside formal civil society structures. And there's a need to acknowledge the fact that um, the digital era, the full industrial revolution, is enabling for so much more connectivity, um, which should essentially create an exchange of knowledge and ensuring that there can be some linkages even when someone doesn't necessarily have the access, the knowledge, or the resources that, you know, amnesty can, you know, sort of serve as a conduit or a convening in terms of some of those different and diverse perspectives. I hope I've been a little bit more clear. My sincerest apologies. I can't see the small I'm using my phone, but um, thank you very much, Dennis and Caesar, for allowing me to actually present my part. Hi, folks. Can you hear me now? Great. Um, let me just say that I'm reminded of a moment uh, from the South African liberation struggle when you followed so many excellent presentations, and if you're the last one, you started by saying most of the really good points I wanted to make have been eloquently made by the previous speakers and then you spoke for about one hour. I've got a few minutes, so let me just raise a couple of questions. So the first is, uh, when I look, I've only been in Amnesty now for uh, ten and a half months, and if I look at, uh, you know, how I considered Amnesty from the outside looking in, about how good it was, 
on partnerships and diversity, uh, if I'm brutally honest, I wouldn't say, you know, I gave it a very high ranking. And I, when I arrived here, I was happy to see that there was a real effort to try and address this question moving forward. However, some of the questions that come up for me in thinking, how do we become better at working in partnerships, but particularly more diverse uh, partnerships like the ones we've actually uh, heard presented today, it is much more uh, challenging than, um, than one would uh, think. So the one thing I observe is that today the movements that are having the greatest uh, kind of excitement, penetration and so on are those that are much more decentralized, not uh, informed by big bureaucratic organizations, which, which in reality is what amnesty is, and are able to move more quickly, more, uh, you know, and, and so the question that arises is, how does an organization that is a bit, you know, uh, heavy, like amnesty is with its policies and procedures and guidelines and so on, and how do we interact with much more light-footed, faster movements? And that's one challenge for us, and guidance from you on how we can address some of those challenges would be helpful. That brings me to my second point, is while Amnesty wants to lift up uh, movements which perhaps are not as well-known and high-profile and branded as Amnesty is, like we try to do with Fridays for the Future movement by giving Greta and the movement the Ambassador of Conscience uh, Award, which was a small uh, gesture on our part, but it has you know, not interfered in any way in how that movement is run and so on. And that's what we want, but I'd like to pose a question to folks is, how do we ensure that we don't, in our quest of wanting to partner with people, uh, actually overwhelm uh, because you know some of those partnerships because from my experience as a head of Greenpeace I would tell you that there were times when we would we would join and support uh, movements that were initiated by others and just because you know Greenpeace and Amnesty as well is more recognized by the media for example when we go and participate the media will sometimes come and interview the Greenpeace people, or in this case Amnesty, when in fact the contribution might have been very marginal. I saw this happen with the Occupy movement uh, and with various national struggles like in the Brazilian uh, transport strikes that took place before the uh, election. Then the next question that I want to uh, raise is, you know, how do we deal with diversity in partnerships, right? Because, for example, uh, Amnesty is doing quite a lot of work internally to try to give voice to young people, right? And when I had a workshop with the global uh, sort of team of about 40 people, I asked them a question: How many of you? How many of you are not? How many of you are not? Uh, you know, at university, of not being at university, you don't plan to be at university. And almost all of them uh, had been to university and uh, and and uh, or we're planning to be and so young people are fighting for diversity within amnesty which is absolutely right they should be because young people need more voice in amnesty as do other constituencies mentioned already but it's interesting that even though they're fighting for that they're not fighting for uh, young workers or unemployed people or high school students they tend to be so focused on youth as a category, but actually, in a sense, the most privileged part of the youth. So any suggestions that you have on how we can address that would also be really, uh, you know, um, would, uh, sorry, the interpreter requested I should slow down. Uh, so, <laughs> so any guidance on how we actually manage that would also be helpful. So the last thing I would say is that, you know, uh, we want to, in our work, uh, evolve much, you know, continue to move closer to the ground, to work at the local level, and we've done major efforts in that direction over the last 15 years. Uh, but the important uh, challenge for us is
how can we do that in a way, especially at the local level, we are a follower, not necessarily a leader, unless when people absolutely request that we need to lead, because sometimes in certain local and national contexts, we might have greater political protection from uh, repression or we might be more willing to take on the repression uh, than some local partners might be willing to. And so we need to just get guidance on when should Amnesty lead in partnerships, when we should follow, when we should walk alongside and so on. And getting some input into that would be really helpful for us in our strategic planning process. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry if I took uh, more than uh, five minutes. But I just want to compliment in handing over the mic all the other presentations because it's exactly the kind of guidance and input that we need. So thank you, everybody. I'm going to, sorry, everyone, I'm going to quickly hand over the mic to Dumi first, and then to Rita, and then Kumi, regarding the questions that Cesar just asked, just so that the speakers are also aware. So Dumi, I'm handing it over to you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I think, uh, you know, the first thing first, recognizes power. And you're finding you need a certain level of capacity in responding to some of the needs for communities those are, that are marginalized and excluded. And I think the first thing is that, you know, you obviously need a very aggressive SD when you're dealing with uh, situations where the most vulnerable, where the most at risk, and where there are, um, you know, systematic security concerns in terms of digital, physical, and economic rights, um, particularly for human rights defenders. And I think that's where, you know, Amnesty has, Amnesty has really been quite um, progressive. Um, however, is it really representative of all the systematic issues, um, I think that's a different question. Um, secondly, I think in environments where there is um, a, 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 an enabling environment for dissent, an enabling environment for organizing, then it would be, you know, have domestic um, or NGOs actually lead that process. Um, and I say this because you're finding that there are a lot of intermediaries, particularly from a regional that would also somewhat be representing um, some of the work that has happened. And I think it's important to acknowledge that the outliers, those that wouldn't necessarily form part of the Council of NGOs, those are the ones that are most at risk and those are the ones that are actually bearing the brunt of repression and um, uh, I guess over-regulation and uh, violence. And I think what's important there is in then, um, you know, what is a practical way of actually reaching out? And I think that's obviously opening up the channels of communication. Um, in, from my own experience and in having sort of met some of Amnesty's employees, it's always been a bit difficult to sort of figure out who's the right person to talk to, who's the right person to sort of present an idea that I'm not necessarily looking for funding for, but that I think the credibility of having maybe a letter of support from Amnesty or even just the institutional link of a referral um, with regards to maybe a country or regional partner would go a long way. So I think it's not necessarily reinventing the wheel, it's just creating the means of access and possibly even um, maybe somewhat of a toolkit on the avenues of possibly ideas so that you can be able to actually host. I mean, I was actually quite surprised there was um, a, a human rights week, I think it was for, 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 for refugees, and Amnesty in New Zealand or Australia were actually helping, oh, had a facility where, um, you know, those organizers who wanted to host uh, a screening of a human rights movie and even have a discussion. That was one way and one tangible example of we are having communities leverage from the credibility, the institutional that is amnesty. And um, I think that's one working, um, um, that's one way of working. And then just lastly, just to mention, you know, I understand that there's so much, you know, knowledge creation and there's so much work in terms of silos and in UN agencies producing content. But we must also acknowledge that people who don't read are the are they educated? And essentially, if we're trying to ensure that the structural barriers of language and administrative cumbersome, for instance, it's very difficult for someone who doesn't have a passport to actually be able to travel to a region where there might be, um, for instance, the Afri African Commission, or where there might be um, a UN agency uh, non-state um, consultation. Um, one clear example, so many sponsorships are offering uh, visa costs and so forth, but they don't actually 
you know, realize that there are people who actually don't have passports in the first place. And something as simple as not being able to be planted in your country can actually mean that a visa is denied. So I think it's, in, it's really in, you know, as Rita was saying, you know, in hiring people who are reflective of the different communities, then you'd at least have a bit of a in them recognizing that position of and then being able to exercise it in a way that is equitable and not just looking at, you know, sort of equal opportunity. So it's about reaching out and trying to use the different ways, whether it's in language, whether it's in technology, or whether it's through things that are locally there and locally relevant and valid in terms of their rapport. Um, it's hard to speak after Dumi. Thanks, uh, Dumi and uh, Rita, for those uh, uh, very helpful uh, contributions. So let me just say that on the question that Rita raised earlier on how we communicate, uh, let me share a perspective and then perhaps people can tell me whether they think I got it right. I mean, I think that to a large extent, a lot of us in uh, more organized movements where we do a lot of advocacy work especially, we tend to talk in ways and a language that is not only not understood by local activists but is also, um, you know, it almost excludes people completely from the conversation, even though that might not be uh, the intent. So on uh, communications, you know, I've been saying since I arrived here that we need a communications first approach, by which I mean that we need to be thinking how will this particular output, how this particular communication land with different audiences. I find that actually a lot of what we publish won't be in fact understood by a large number of volunteers of Amnesty, let alone people outside of uh, Amnesty. So, so some of the ideas that was shared about using arts and culture earlier is where I think we need to be putting our emphasis and we are looking at, at that a little bit, but any thoughts on that would be helpful. Let me raise the second issue which is, you know, if, uh, it's a little bit of an uncomfortable issue these days. I mean, in the old days, uh, when I say old days, I'm talking about really the old days now, you know, before the fall of the Berlin Wall. A lot of our, our analysis was a very class-based analysis. You know, we talked about uh, different classes uh, and had a differentiated approach to working class versus middle class versus, you know, the bourgeoisie, as we used to call them, and so on. And I think that you know, even if I reflect when I was on the board, I'm just thinking now aloud, right? When I was on the board of the uh, AWID, the Association for Women's Rights and Development, and at that time we had a young women's uh, a leadership program. And if I think about the class base of all the people that made the program, uh, qualified for the fellowships, went through the learning and so on, again, we were not able to break beyond people who come from either upper class or middle class backgrounds because of the requirement of a certain educational qualification level and while you know that's one solution getting around that about being more accessible I would like to just ask if people have any reflections on how what are the other strategies that we can break because amnesty if we're going to become a stronger movement, has to be a movement that goes beyond the middle class uh, and embraces uh, folks in other constituencies and language and um, and approach are both things that we need to improve on. So any um, guidance on that would be helpful. Um, with that, I hand it back to Cesar to wrap up. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, thank you, interpreters. Thank you, Cesar. Thank you, speakers. And um, as Cesar said, follow the, our conversations online. Um, and on that, on that note, I'm going to end the conversation. So I hope you have a wonderful day wherever in the world you are, or evening. Uh,